Patron saint of the season Welcome back to Fish on Northwest. I am Tommy Donlin, back in the Bait Lab, brought to you by Max Lure. Hey, tonight we are gonna talk about how to make a halibut rig. Um, pretty simple, but I wanna go into the details of how I put these together, kind of what are the components that I use, and basically why, you know, why do I think that this creates success, okay? And so I wanna jump pretty quickly right down to the table and I want to show you what we're working with here. Now this is your, as far as lures go, this is your standard issue nine inch pearl white B2 squid, okay? Um, you're gonna notice some pretty heavy leader that I've got uh, on this rig right here. And I'm using 250 pound Berkeley Big Game. Kind of looks like this, comes up coiled in a package. Um, I would say anything that you're using that's north of 150 pound is okay. But I just like the assurance of having a little bit heavier leader. Um, and I can still tie, if you look at the hook rig, I can still tie these egg loop knots onto the hooks. So it's still malleable enough to where I can get that knot tied um, correctly, you know, without burning the line or without kinking the leader. So it still works really well. Um, 250 big game Berkeley. Um, now on the business end of this, and I'm going to use anywhere from 10 aughts to 12 aughts. These are Gamakatsu big river hooks. The reason I love these hooks is they've just got a hell of a gap on them and they've got a big throat. They're strong. I've never had one break or fail and they've got a really fine point. So when you go to set the hook, you are really driving this hook into the mouth of that halibut. Um, one of the things that I do wanna show you that's really important is the hook spacing, okay? When you look at this hook spacing, I put my hand in here, you're looking at anywhere from about, I would say five to, five to six inches. Um, now the reason that you want this spacing, if you think about it, and I fish, um, I fish a lot of bait, okay? And I fish a lot of big bait. And so whether that's, you know, trout or kokanee, or whether it's fishing a whole shad, right? I mean, these baits are anywhere from like nine inches on the small end all the way up to a foot long, maybe even 14, 15 inches. Uh, I'm really not afraid, dude. I'm telling you, a 30 pound halibut will come up to this rig, open its mouth, and that rig will completely disappear into its gullet, game over. So you do not have to worry about having a small or a, a large bait at all. So when I go back down and I'm looking at this hook gap in here, the gap between the trailing edge of the leading hook and the eye of the trailing hook, um, it's gonna be considerable. And the reason for that is the head of the bait is going right here. I'm gonna take this hook and I'm gonna go, to go through the bottom jaw of that bait out the top of the head. And I want the bait to really be very center line, okay? I'm not trying to make it spin. I'm not rigging a cut plug. I'm not rigging a whole herring to do kind of a drill bit style. I don't want this bait to spin at all because if you think about it, we're fishing pretty deep. You know, typically we're fishing 360 feet of water all the way down to 850 feet of water. You start putting something into the equation that spins, it'll get caught on your main line. It'll get all bunched up because it's a heavy leader. Um, just a whole, a whole bunch of bad things will happen. Um, and so I stay away from doing that. So that's why when you look at the hook rig, I'm rigging it right through the very center line of that bait. And then this hook is gonna end up somewhere either at the dorsal or just behind the dorsal of the bait. That's why I have this hook spacing. Now, you, you might say, well, Tommy, I want this trailing hook at like the tail of the bait. I may want it like back here. And I will tell you, do not do that. Um, because what ends up happening is you make this too long and now you've got something that'll pivot. Okay. This whole thing will pivot and you'll end up with the trail hook around your main line or around the top of the leader. And then you're not fishing, right? You're wishing. Okay. So there is like a sweet spot there in terms of how long I make the spread between the hooks. Okay, really important detail. We go back to the board here. The, the next thing you're gonna see is I've got a series of beads and then I've got a corky. And the corky is really sized to, this, to the, the head of this uh, plastic squid, this B2 squid that I'm using. That really sizes that. Um, now what I'm going for here is a couple things. One, um, when I pull this in, right, I want the lead hook. Okay, so now that 
that corky is right up here at the head of the squid you know obviously there's the there's the very top it's got to be much larger than the diameter of the hole coming out the top because you don't want it to pull through but if you look at where this lead hook is okay it's not riding into the squid if you don't put enough spacers in here between that corky and the eye of this hook what ends up happening is it's going to bend this squid and it's not going to look natural okay so you want to have good spacing um between the top corky and where the eye of the hook is and so you'll just have to play with it depending on the size of the hoochie that you're using but this gives you a really good idea of about how many beads and and a corky now the other thing about a corky and you can upsize this but you can make your whole rig neutrally buoyant okay so with with a big heavy bait on there it's going to want to sink right and so don't be afraid to put a large corky in there to help that rig kind of stabilize in a neutral attitude right um and when i when you some of the, the larger squids that we run so this is a 14 inch b2 squid pearl white um with a couple 12 watt big river hooks that's what's inside it right i'm taking a full float and i'm putting it in the head of that bait I want that squid to be streamlined, not floating, not sinking, just kind of streamlined in a neutral buoyant position um, behind my spreader bar. Okay, so that brings me to looking at the top end of the leader. Okay, now for demonstration purposes, I crimp this one. Now you can crimp it or you can tie it. When I do tie it, the knot that I use is a San Diego knot that looks kind of like that. That's a San Diego knot there. If you're not comfortable tying and you'd rather crimp to have a cleaner connection, no problem at all. What you're gonna do is when, you, when you're crimping, this is all monofilament. So you're gonna use aluminum crimps, okay? These are aluminum barrel crimps. I like to use the Jinkai crimps. Um, never had a crimp failure with these. Used them on some pretty big fish. Never had an issue. What you do when you pick your crimp, you're gonna pick, you're gonna figure out what line you're running. So this is 250 and you'll notice that on the backside of these, and I don't expect you to see it with the camera, but on the backside, there's a chart and it tells you, hey, if you're gonna run 250 pound test you are going to run the size h sleeve okay and that's all there is to it so you grab that sleeve out of here and you can you can double crimp if you want to but you really don't have to and then you're going to grab your crimper okay now your crimper also has um you know a set of guides on it to tell you hey well your your crimp size is a 1.4 Okay, so that's the notch that you need to use within your crimper. Now, this is the part where I see people do this wrong over and over again. They put this crimp in here the wrong direction. And I will tell you that you have to put it in, see if I can get it just like that. Okay, if you crimp it any other way, that's wrong. That's how you crimp a barrel crimp. You've got to have this style of crimpers and you've got to have it in this orientation. Now, the other thing that I will tell you is that if you look at it this way and it's probably hard to see, so I'll just explain it. When you crimp this crimp, you're not, you're not crimping at the very end of the crimp. You leave that flared. You are just putting the crimper in the very middle of your crimp so that on each end of the crimp, it's flared out. That does a couple things, okay? That really makes so that the load introduction from the line into the crimp is like nice and gradual. And the other thing is you don't crimp the ends because you crimp the end, you know, it's aluminum, right? It's metal. So you can put a sharp edge on that crimp that can then dig into the line. So that's the reason why you're only gonna crimp this only in the very middle and let the ends flare out. Okay, and that's how you're gonna that's how you're gonna crimp it. Okay, now talking about tipping this. Now, obviously, um, I'm big into using using bait. Um, now, if you're having a problem with dogfish, you know, do not hesitate to go to an artificial lure. Um, I got a couple of them that I just absolutely love to use. This one is the Big Hammer nine inch glow bug, uh, glow bug, and this is just a phenomenal bait. It's got a huge tail on it, kicks like crazy, and I will literally, if we go back down to the squid rig here, I will, I will put that 
right here. I will rig it on the lead hook, let the trail hook trail like it does, put a little bit of stretchy thread midship here on the bait, and then, and that's it. Now the other one that's also a great bait uh, made by Berkeley is your power bait, okay? And I don't know how they make these things, but I tell you what, they work and they've got, um, basically they're made with fish and they smell like fish, they smell like a bait. Um, and so I'll tell you like, if you're gonna use one of these for the day, you're gonna put it on this hook and you're gonna fish it, at the end of the day, do not leave it on the hook, okay? Take it off the hook, put it back in the bag. Um, I like to store them in the bag. You can tell if you look at a couple of these, I mean, these things have been absolutely chewed up, um, but I've taken them back and I put them back in the bag. They just store better, it's a Ziploc bag, um, and you don't want your lure smelling like fish or your whole tackle box smelling like fish. Um, so again, a couple great options, big hammer, and then the power bait. Um, you can't go wrong with either one of those. Okay, now the question comes, how do you present this bait? Um, you got two main options. You got your spreader bar, and then you also have a slider rig, right? And if we look at this slider rig, basically, it's just, uh, this one's made out of tuna cord, 200 pound tuna cord, very, very simple. It's got a swivel in the middle. This one's a corkscrew. It's got one end that has a barrel swivel, another end that has a corkscrew swivel. The barrel swivel goes to your main line. You put a weight on here. I use a light dropper loop, um, like a 30 pound dropper or 25 pound dropper, something that you can break off, you know, maybe a foot to a lead to your cod lead, and then this goes to your leader. So this is just gonna go on here like this. Now you go, well, when do, we, when do you use the slider rig? When do you use the spreader bar? I like to use a slider rig when I've got a pretty good amount of current and I'm not gonna worry about that squid getting hung up on my main line. Um, if I've got just kind of a slow current or, or maybe kind of a dead current, I'm gonna use the spreader bar because no matter what, this upper bar here, keeps that hoochie rig away from my main line, which is gonna attach right here. So this is gonna go to your weight, this end will go to your main line, this is gonna go to your leader, okay? And it's always gonna keep it spaced out. Now I will tell you personally, I don't like snap swivels in my equation. If it was up to me, I would tie a line directly to the hook, okay? And if I have to, crimp it, because every one of these snap swivels is just a failure point. So you're gonna see me when I attach to a lure or a jig, or I'm attaching to a pipe jig or to this spreader bar, I'm not gonna run a snap swivel off my main line. I'm gonna tie direct to this and I'm gonna use a double San Diego. Okay, so I'm gonna double the line and then I'm gonna tie my knot and I'm not gonna have to worry about this connection. It's one less connection I have to worry about. I'm not really worried about the weight one. You lose a weight, big deal. You replace it, grab another one, keep going. This one here is your critical one, okay? So you gotta make sure that you've got good snap swivels that of course you shut it. There's nothing wrong with the snap swivel. Um, test the gear out. I mean, I pull on my gear hard. I pull on my gear harder than if any fish is gonna ever pull on that gear, okay? Because if it's gonna fail, I want it to fail topside in the boat, in my hands, after I just got done rigging it. I don't want it to fail on a fish, okay? So a couple things to keep in mind there. Um, the last thing I do wanna mention that I think is just really important, you know, we talked with Ron Goner from Puget Sound Anglers tonight, and the thing that's just super important for everybody to understand, and in Washington, it's now law, you have to have a descending device, okay? But let me tell you, you want to have a descending device. Okay, a couple of reasons. So you catch that yellow eye, you can't keep yellow eye, right? That population is still in recovery. You need to descend that fish, okay? Um, the sequelizer, that's what this product is here, the sequelizer, and it comes in two different depth ranges. This one's the, the, the deep water, they call it the deep water one. It's the 100, you can set it to 100, 200, or 300 feet. Uh, that's the one I use, and I don't even guess, right? I, when I hook, hook this to the fish's jaw, I always set it for 300 feet um, because my thought process is, is, hey, if it takes that fish 200 feet or 250 feet to kind of come alive and wiggle off, I want to get that fish uh, descended to as deep as possible. And I use a downrigger. It's the easiest way to do it. You don't have to take a rod out of rotation. You don't have to quit fishing. 
Literally, this is attached to the downrigger with a 15 pound ball, and this just gets hooked right onto that fish's mouth, and away you go. And this, the jaws are so strong on this that you can actually hook, if you got two smaller rockfish, you can put two on at one time and send them down. Um, I've got a ton of Raymarine screenshots um, from my sonar that show the downrigger coming down, fish coming back to life around 180 feet, releasing and swimming down and away from the downrigger fish survive um, and it's a way that we are just absolutely going to continue um, to allow as many deep water days as we have if you look at the fishing opportunity we have now with halibut deep water and link cod and deep water it's phenomenal it's the best opportunity that we've had in years and it's because Um, if you're a Puget Sound Angler member, you can get one of these as part of being a member. Um, these things are just money. I love them. They're easier than the other styles. So always keep that in mind. All right. And that's it here in the bay. I'm going to throw it back to uh, Dwayne in studio after a short break. Don't go anywhere. Northwest.